Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology, and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International GCSE Biology Paper 1B for June 2022. This is the third video. I will put the link to the first part and the second part video below the description box. Let us begin. Question 7 says the diagram shows the human heart with four chambers and four blood vessels. So here we can see they've given us S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. That is the right atrium. This is the blood vessel called the vena cava, bringing blood that is deoxygenated from the rest of the body. This one here is taking this part here, the, the blood vessel, which is the pulmonary artery, is taking the oxygenated blood to the lungs. This one here is taking oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. And this is bringing in oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. And finally, this is the left ventricle. So that is what we can see here. And then the first question says, which blood vessel brings deoxygenated blood to the heart? It means this blood is coming from the rest of the body, so it should be the vena cava, and the answer should be A, because it's blood vessel U. The next they say, which chamber pumps oxygenated blood away from the heart? Oxygenated blood leaves the heart if it's going to the rest of the body. That should be, uh, the chamber that pumps should be this one here, or we can call it the left ventricle. This is the one that is more muscular than the right ventricle, so... Having a thicker muscle allows it to pump blood at higher pressure because it's going to the rest of the body. Moving on, here they say, explain the difference in the wall of chamber S and the wall of chamber Z. Now they want us to explain the difference. So I said S, which is the right ventricle, is thinner and less muscular than Z. Z is the left ventricle. So for this, it ensures that S produces less pressure to pump blood to the lungs with less force. Remember the lungs are closed, so it's a shorter distance, we do not need more pressure. However, Z, which is the left ventricle, is thicker and more muscular, and this ensures that Z generates high enough pressure to pump the blood to the rest of the body. So uh, you would get the marks you're looking for. Next they say, humans need a balanced diet for healthy growth and development. Give the function of three different components of a balanced diet. But a balanced diet contains carbohydrates. And as you know, carbohydrates are a source of energy uh, for respiration or what we get from respiration. Now, the other are proteins. Proteins are used to provide amino acids for growth, repair, and production of enzymes. Amino acids are used to make structural proteins as well as functional proteins like enzymes and hormones. So these are for growth. Next, fats are used for insulation and as a reserve source for energy. If there is not enough glucose in your body, fats can be hydrolyzed to provide energy. There is also fiber. Fiber is used for peristalsis. Food can move through the digestive system. Vitamins, examples, vitamin D is a good source. Uh, it helps us or it helps our bones to absorb calcium. As well as I uh, hear the minerals, I give example calcium, which is good for bone and teeth growth. Here they say, scientists investigated the link between body mass and coronary heart disease in a population in Australia. So it means it was only carried out in Australia. The scientists recorded the number of heart attacks in a population of 850 people for or a period of 20 years. They classified the people as normal mass, overweight or obese, and they calculated rates of heart attacks that allowed a value comparison to be made between the groups. Here the groups we have are ages under 40, those between 40 and 60, those over 60, and all ages. We can see that for all ages, as mass increases, there is a higher chance of heart attacks. As we can see, obese people have a higher chance. And those below under 40 have the lowest chance of having a heart attack. Then those between uh, 40 and 60, we can see the highest is among the obese people. And those over 60, we can see these ones have a higher chance in comparison to those who are obese. So the question said, evaluate what the data shows about the relationship between our classification of body mass, age, and heart attacks. I said, over all ages, which is this, increase in mass leads to increase in coronary heart disease. As we can see, as mass increases, moving to from our normal mass to obese, you can see this one has the highest. I also said heart attacks are more common in older groups who are of normal weight and overweight. This is that and that in comparison to that. So I also said, those between 40 and 60 are more likely to have heart attacks due to obesity than any other group range. You can see this calculated rate is 27 in comparison to all the other three. Compared to that and that, this is the highest. I also said the study was carried out for a long period of time and on a large number of people, so it can be reliable. 
Taking you back here, the question said, it was carried out for 20 years. There is a longitudinal study, so it is reliable. And the people were 850, so we can believe the results. I also went on to say, however, it was carried out only in one country, Australia. So it is. it may not be representative enough for other people. I also said some other factors were not included. So in this table, they didn't give us the other risk factors, like how do people exercise? Are they smokers? Because heart attacks or coronary heart disease is not only caused by body mass. It could be caused by somebody's lifestyle. Do they smoke? Are they active enough? And so on. So that kind of information was not given here. So I said other factors like smoking, exercise, blood pressure have not been included, yet they could be linked to coronary heart disease as well. So this brings us to the end of question seven. Let us continue to question eight. Question eight, for color in red is controlled by a gene with two alleles. So one allele calls for black for color, the other allele calls for agouti for color. Several female rats with agouti colored fur are mated with several male rats with black colored fur. So they say all of the offsprings have agouti fur. Guys, there is no way this could be except if both parents were homozygous. So it means the black were homozygous and the, those that ha had a gooty color were homozygous. So mating them, all products or all offsprings were heterozygous. So that is why we can say they all had a gooty color. However, let's go on. They say, explain which allele is dominant. So here we can see because the offsprings are all agouti, it means offsprings are heterozygous and agouti is dominant over the black color. I showed this for agouti, agouti, uh, for this is homozygous, for agouti and this is homozygous for black. It means all the offsprings had this kind of ge genotype, meaning if they were all agouti, so agouti should be dominant. So I say, since all offsprings are agouti, they are all heterozygous. Failure for the black allele to be expressed means it is recessive. Next, a male and female right from these offsprings are then mated together in a second cross. So meaning we are mating heterozygotes now. Some of the offsprings of this second cross have a goatee color for, uh, colored fur and some have black colored fur. They want us to draw a genetic diagram to show this second cross. And they want us to include the genotype of the parents, the gametes they produce, and the genotypes and the phenotypes of the offsprings. So since all parents are going to be hetero heterozygous, I say the genotypes of the parents is that and that, meaning the gametes produced by the parents are either this or that. Now, looking at this genetic cross, the possible offsprings were that, 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 and that. So the offspring genotype is going to be capital A, capital A, or capital A small a, or small a small a. And the offspring phenotype is going to be in a ratio of three to one, agouti to black. So this is what I got. Next, they say I calculate the probability of any of one offspring from this second cross being male with agouti colored fur. So for this case, I had to calculate the probability of male times the probability of agouti. We know for any parent, probability of having a male is one over two because there is a one in two chance of having a male or one in two chance of having a female. Also, for agouti, since we have seen there are three out of the total, that is four, so it's going to be three over four. When you multiply this, you get three over eight, which is the same as that. So representing it like that or saying 37.5%, would be correct and you get the two marks. Here they say, scientists observed that genes that control fur color in rats can affect rat behavior, such as how tame they are. Other genes that control the size of the adrenal glands and the production of neurotransmitters also affect rat behavior. Scientists also noticed that coat, for, coat color is associated with differences in anatomy and physiology, such as the size of the adrenal glands and the production of neurotransmitters. State the name of the type of genetic control uh, where many genes control one phenotype. This is a polygenic trait, or you could say it's polygenic. Next, they say, explain why the size of the adrenal glands and the production of neurotransmitters would affect rat behavior. We know that adrenal glands produce adrenaline, and adrenaline is going to prepare the body for activity. So it means if the, large, the adrenal glands are large, there is going to be production of a lot of adrenaline and the body is going to be very active. So the heart, heart rate is going to be higher and so many effects that adrenaline causes are going to be intensified. And also overproduction of maybe production of neurotransmitters. If more neurotransmitters are produced, then it means that there is going to be 
um, movement or transfer of these neurotransmitters into the synapse. And uh, the neuron after the synapse is going to receive a lot of stimulation, meaning uh, it means impulses are going to be created faster. So I said larger adrenal glands could produce more adrenaline and this will affect the heart rate of the rat, making it hyperactive. Higher production rates of neurotransmitters at synapses will lead to faster impulse transmission and quicker response times. So it means it's going to be uh, very reactive and very responsive. So moving on. Here they say some rats with white fur also have pink eyes. These rats have pink eyes because they do not have pigment in their irises. This means that their irises let light pass through, unlike the colored irises found in other rats. Explain how this difference in the iris affects vision of the rat with pink eyes. Now, uh, if their irises will not block less light, meaning they allow more light to go through, it means the change or dilation or constriction of the pupil will have no significant effect. In the end, more light will still go into the eye, and if it goes to the retina, it could damage the light-sensitive cells. That means there is going to be failure or vision is going to be affected, so these rats may not be able to see properly because much light entered into their eyes, and uh, it damaged the photosensitive cells, the ones you call the rods and cones, so the retina is not working properly. So they could be blind or they could be visually impaired. So this brings us to the end of question eight. Let us continue to question nine. Question nine, selective breeding has been used to develop modern varieties of wheat. I want you to describe how scientists could use selective breeding to increase wheat yield. So here, in selective breeding, you will get parent plants that have the highest yield and cross them together. Obtain offsprings and choose offsprings with the highest yield and cross them together in a second generation. Then repeat these crosses over long periods of time, every time choosing offsprings with the highest yield and cross them until you obtain the desired yield. So here I say cross parents with the highest yield and then select from the offsprings plants with the highest yield or it could be mass and cross them again and then repeat this for several generations to obtain your desired yield. Down here they say during a long-term study of selective breeding scientists collected data for the mean yield of wheat in tons per hectare and the table shows the scientists data. This is the data we have here uh, so let's continue. So here they said plot a line graph to show how the mean yield changes from that to that and use a ruler to join points uh, with a straight line. So here, I had to use the table to plot the data. The scale was from zero to seven. And here I positioned the years as given in the table. And then I put every point, this is really easy, just go putting at every point and then connect them using a straight line. Remember to label the y-axis as mean mass in tons per hectare. And here, this has to be in years, connecting the points that is it, you'll be able to get the marks you're looking for. So you have to make sure you use an appropriate scale, use a straight line through all the points, and then correct. Uh, you have to use a correct X and Y axis, and then the points have to be in the correct positions. So next, they say in 1960, a dwarf variety of wheat replaced the old variety. Scientists compare the percentage change in yield for the two varieties. They say the percentage change in yield per year from 1840 to 1960 was 0.06 per year. Here, they want us to calculate the percentage change in yield per year from 1960 to 2020. To do this, we need to know that percentage change should be the change divided by the original times 100. And the change that has occurred is from, from the table is 6.7 uh, minus 2.8, meaning originally uh, in that year it was 2.8 and in the final year it was 6.7. So that uh, and that. So we subtract it and then divide by that the way it was in 1960 multiplied by 100. Remember here we want to find percentage change in yield per year. So we have to divide through by the number of years. They were 60 years and finally we got uh, the answer is 2.3 percent. Moving on. Here they said rough wheat has a shorter thicker stem than old variety. They want to suggest why growing rough wheat is an advantage for farmers. Remember they have shorter stems. It means they are not going to become longer, so the energy they would have used to become longer is going to be stored and used for something else. And also, being thicker, it means they're going to be stable. So they are short and thick, they're not going to be stable. They cannot be easily 
uh, kind of destroyed by winds. So I said, shorter and thicker stems give the plant greater stability, so it is less likely to fall. Less energy will be used or will be required since it does not need to grow tall. So more energy will be saved or stored and available in the grain and the shorter grains will be easily harvested. So if you had put these, you would get the three marks. This brings us to the end of question nine. Let us continue to question 10. Question 10, there is a relationship between the color of a flower and pollination by insects. They want you to design an investigation to find out if the color of a flower affects how attractive it is to pollinators. And they want you to include experimental detail in your answer and write in full sentences. Now, this is going to be difficult for us to use the same species of flower that has at least five different colors. Naturally, it could be hard to find a flower having the same species but different uh, five different colors. So I suggest maybe you just use the shape of the flower. Maybe you could cut a flower-shaped paper and then let it be of different color. Let it be the same scent and then expose it to the same species and same number of pollinators and observe which color the pollinators prefer. So I said, set up experiments using at least five different colored flowers. These flowers should be from plants of the same species and age or use flowers of the same shape. So this one here should be if you chose paper flowers. Repeat each experiment to calculate the mean. This is the mean number of pollinators that approach that specific color. Then count the number of insects that land on each flower in a specific time. The time has to be constant or standard. Then all experiments carried out for the same period of time. Uh, the insects used should be of the same species and the same number per experiment. So if you choose bees, use only bees and let them be the same number of bees exposed. Lastly, here I say the flower should have the same scent and in the same location. Same scent, same location so that they have the same chance of exposure. So here I say to ensure these papers can be used to make flowers, uh, paper flowers or these can be colored differently but have the same scent. Then the number of insects that come to the specific flower per specific time can be counted. Repeats can be carried out at each color or each flower color to calculate the main number. So if you could do this, you would get the marks that were awarded here. This brings us to the end of uh, this question 10 as well as the end to this paper. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.